Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, another special edition of Let Us Reason. With you here is Al Fadi, and joining us in studio virtually is our dear sister Khadija, whom you have, by the way, probably have watched her testimony about two weeks ago. And I tell you what, the testimony is going like wildfire. So praise the Lord for that. If you can uh, uh, go and find that testimony on our channel, uh, which is here international, please share it with many people, and especially with many of our Muslim women who need to really know that Christ should be their eternal husband. He is the one that will set them free. So we're not saying anything about their husbands. We're not accusing their husbands of being mean or anything like that. It depends. Uh, I've, I've seen some uh, Muslim men who are wonderful, but uh, the bottom line is they need salvation in Christ. And that's what we're talking about. With that says, dear sister, thank you so much again for uh, making the time to join us. We, You are oh, welcome thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me onto your show again. And I'm excited really to to share some more um, of my personal experiences and to explore um, this time marriage and the contract of marriage under Islam and unpick what that entails. So I'm really looking forward to that this evening. Amen. Thank you so much. So uh, we made an announcement uh, that the topic is going to be about an ex-Muslim woman's view on marriage and marriage relationship. And I think you, you used the phrase that I liked and I also captured, which is contacts without love. Why don't you explain that particular phrase? So the reason why I came up with the title contracts without love is because once we sort of start unpicking and going through this journey in this, this live stream, we will find that marriage under Islam is a contract. It is actually a contract. That's what it is. And unfortunately, many people have this mis misconception that marriage under Islam is similar to the marriage which we know as uh, being in the Western world or within Christianity, where it's a covenant before God. Unfor unfortunately, marriage under Islam is nothing of that sort. So today, I really hope to get that message across to show that marriage under Islam, the nikah, is actually a contract. And, you know, hopefully we're going to be able to dispel the notion that regressive interpretations of the Quran are due to cultural influences and practices where customs and values that are placed on women as, as subordinates to men in marriage. Um, hopefully today we're going to be able to lay to rest those mis misconceptions and show how the Muslim woman is uh, not elevated or emancipated through the context of marriage in Islam, but she really is just um, a, 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 a pawn, I suppose, mm -hmm. within an equation. So to start, let's begin. Let, let's start from the beginning then. Sure. Who, who can I marry? As a Muslim woman, who can I marry? Well, the Quran is quite explicit, really, in telling men who they can marry. So you, you'll see that, you'll know this, Al-Fadi, yourself, um, in Surah 5.5. 5, it says, lawful to you in marriage are chaste women from the believers and chaste women for those who were given the scriptures, as in the Jews and the Christians, before your time, when you have given their due, Mahar, so we'll talk about that later on, the bridal money given to the husband, to the wife at the time of marriage. So it's clear who Muslim men can marry. But on the other hand, it's not so clear in the Quran who women can marry. Now, why is it that Allah didn't make that distinction? Why did he not just put men and women can marry X, Y or Z? There's no stipulation, unfortunately. But you'll find within Muslim communities and also under Sharia, it's, it's very, very much impeded upon a Muslim woman to find a Muslim man to marry. It's always that it always seems seems to be the case. OK, so Muslim women, if you are seeking a husband, you will be told by your community to find a good Muslim role model to marry, not just for yourself, but also for the future of your children, because your children will need to be brought up as Muslim, Muslim children under the Islamic faith. Right. Okay, so let's say you found someone to marry. Well done. You've, you've actually found somebody who you want to marry. Now, since you believe in Islam and you believe that both men and women are equal in, in rights, then all you need to do is both consent and turn up. Right, brother? Is, is, is that surely must be the case if you're both equal? That's true. This, this is wrong. This is the first barrier to equality, uh, to inequality in marriage under Islam. Women in Islam are not equal 
I was not an equal when I was married under Islam. You will need to get the permission from your guardian. And that is not your mother, but a male guardian who is also known in Arabic. I believe it's as your, I believe it's Wali in, in Arabic. Correct. So when, when I was when I was seeking to get married, my, my story, let, let's bring this back to me, my story. My father never gave me permission to marry the, the man that I wanted. Although he was a Muslim, my father didn't give me permission. So I had to then go and find another male guardian to permit me to get married to somebody of my choice. Now, this male guardian was an imam of a local mosque who I never met, I'd never spoken to until the day of my actual nikah. And Brother al Fadi, maybe you can elaborate on what the actual meaning of nikah is under uh, uh, in Arabic. My understanding is that it's it's a marriage it is a marriage contract. It is. And basically, Sharia law allows for a number of things, obviously. One of it is regulating rituals, for instance. Uh, another thing is dealing with crimes. But there is another uh, part of Sharia law, which is transactions, business transactions. And believe it or not, marriage falls under that. It is a business deal. And I don't know how it is where you grew up, for instance, but I can speak in Saudi, for instance. You go and you ask uh, the hand of someone for marriage as a male and her father can negotiate with you how much mahar, you know, or dowry they need. And you can also stipulate that, of course, in the case of divorce, I'm entitled to this much back and so on and so forth. So it is a business transaction. Absolutely. And we're going to come into that mahar a little bit later on so this imam who, who i'd never met before he became my guardian where he asked me if i was happy to marry this man and he was the one that granted me permission then to take part in this nikah now without a wali the islamic marriage contract is null and void so having a male guardian is actually a prerequisite to 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 a marriage so women cannot get married without a male guardian okay however right. what what is not what is not a prerequisite is your presence at the time of the exchange of the contracts. Now that's that sounds bizarre, but as a bride, you do not actually have to be there present Correct. whilst you get married. Okay, and also don't forget, a man doesn't need a guardian. So immediately, this uh, men and women are equal under the law of of Islam is already is already being being dispelled. So. Okay, if you're not, as a bride, if you're not there, if you're not present, what happens? A bride can send two male witnesses at the time of nikah as long as the agreement has been drawn up and agreed upon beforehand. And in this agreement, as you said, brother, you will write things in there which, which you wish to stipulate within your marriage, so, so the mahar, uh, the dowry. So, and, and some of those things that can go into those agreements, th that will go in those agreements, we, we will discuss a little bit later on. So here's a scenario. Here is the recipe for uh, Islamic marriage for our sisters out there. So during your marriage, you will need, number one, a bridegroom who preferably is a Muslim, although the Quran doesn't actually say that, but you can only have one, one bridegroom, okay? You will need a male guardian who is a wali, who will give you consent to your marriage. You'll need this. You'll need an, an imam to oversee the exchange of contracts. You will also need two witnesses to preside over witnessing your marriage. And these witnesses have to be men, two male witnesses. OK, and then also either you, the bride in person can be present or you will need two further male witnesses on your behalf to make sure that your your exchange of contracts is, is, is done. Now, it begs the question, why would a bride not turn up to her own wedding? If I was a bride, I would want to be at my wedding. Most women would want to be at their wedding as a bride. Well, when I was looking into this, I stumbled upon something and, you know, well, let's look no further than the example of a young bride. Let's say this young bride was either the age of six or maybe nine, where she really doesn't care nor understand about contracts of marriage or the, even the meaning of marriage. She just wants to maybe play on a swing or with her dolls. Maybe this is one of the reasons why the bride is allowed to have leave and to allow two witnesses to take her place. What do you think, Brother Al-Fadi, about this? Well, I mean, of course, that's uh, one possibility. In fact, uh, you can, as a, a father or as a welly, uh, uh, you could dictate uh, that someone who is maybe a one-year-old 
that she could be married to someone provided that you know he cannot consummate the marriage until she is at a certain age so there is a uh, something to be said about that you're absolutely correct and obviously the reason why you don't have to be there because there is a contract negotiation that is taking place now you can have a party later i mean uh, we're not saying you cannot have the party and be involved but you touch on a number of things here one of it also you said that sometimes you can be married just uh by virtue of proxy uh, i don't know I, I mean when you grow up did you hear of stories of women by the way that realized that they were married al already or given out in marriage by their parents without their knowledge absolutely especially yeah. within the pakistani muslim community you, you you know young girls were being bet betrothed if yeah, you like given away i said given, given out. away yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. given away to to cousins or you know members in the community you know and they were almost like business transactions where you know your father had already negotiated with with maybe your uncle or you know because they had maybe some land dispute in the past or there was something going on where the daughter was given it in exchange and her hand was given already in marriage and by the time the girl came to an age where she was you know of an age of 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 where her father believed she was of an age of being able to be married that's not necessarily when she felt she was of an age but when her father felt he was she was of an age and this may have been the age of 9 or 10 or maybe even 7 depending on this girl's own maturity he would then give her away in marriage so yes this is something that's quite common in the in the muslim community yep and you know, by the way uh, is that uh, sometimes people and i work a lot with um, uh, you know missionaries who are uh, you know witnessing let's say to uh, muslim female students sometimes or or somebody that they've known and they tell me you know so and so was single she went back home to visit her family she came back and she was married i'm disappointed she never said anything to me about that well i tell them you know what she probably didn't even know that she was going to get married you see in a western mind they're thinking oh she was dating that person she was engaged to that person she kept it a secret i wonder why she's not sharing such an important thing with me and they take it personal my pushback is the poor soul didn't even know probably that she's married and she was given away in marriage without her knowledge and she can't do anything about it absolutely and you know one of the first victims of this are muslim women unfortunately and this is why it's so important for us to highlight these things because before a woman is married she is the property of her father her father is her guardian she's not a person in her own right her father is her guardian and she belongs to her father and what her father decides for her that is what she needs to follow once her father decides that this is a person who she's going to marry then that baton is almost handed over to her husband who then takes control and he becomes superior to her and he then becomes her guardian in effect so one of the other things that is needed um when when a woman is to get married is like you said before it's the uh, the mahar or the dowry which is written into the agree into the uh, agreement now this is uh, i think this is in surah 44 where it talks about the woman is is due her duty but if you if you willingly um decides not 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 to not to take it then you know her husband can consume it with with good pleasure um and that that is usually a monetary amount and it can range from anything from a dollar to thousands of pounds so this is clearly you know a business transaction because there is money that is involved whenever there is money involved it's clearly going to be something to do with with with, uh, with business it's not a, it's not where there's an exchange of love or where they're saying right you know as a measure of love you have to do x y and z this is about money it's about right for you to take my for, for you to marry you know you need to give the woman this amount of money for this contract to take place this is bizarre i mean which culture which community which religion do you see that a marriage is actually um pulled together because of money that's right it's just, it's just not you know if anyone gets married to money what are they called gold diggers you know this is this is what they're called but under islam this is something that's prescribed by the quran um and although it's it's money which the the woman can keep and we will go into this in another in another in another live stream but if she is to divorce then you know she has to then negate that and give that back it's almost like her husband will get a refund for, right. for her leaving. Right. You know, so she's not. You know, she's not. She's not. She's not treated with um, with uh, with love or respect. She's just a commodity that can be returned. 
if she's found to be faulty or, you know, he doesn't want her anymore. Yeah. So uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention to people, you know, maybe some, uh, you know, some of them are uh, witnessing or, or noticing that I am looking at something. And really what I have in my hand here is something called the reliance of the traveler, which is kind of like a uh, an abridged Sharia law guide. According to one of the schools of Sharia, this one happened to be the Shafi'i school of Sharia. And I have in front of me the uh, basically the section on marriage called nikah here of course it has conditions by the way or pillars if you wish uh, and here are those five basically uh, uh, conditions one you know is that you have to have uh, some form uh, of a negotiation language that is clear right it has to be clear and everybody can understand it you have to have witnesses. You mentioned that already. And they have to be male witnesses, as you mentioned. And interestingly enough, by the way, you mentioned two male witnesses. You know, uh, Sister Khadija, what would happen if you cannot find two men? What would you do? Is a testimony of a woman allowed uh, in Islam? What, what would happen in this case? Because I well, want the you, people to benefit from that. Yeah, well, we know half a you know, one male is like two females because a woman right. is, of course, of deficient mind. So That's if you right. need two, if, if there are two, if they're not, if there isn't two male witnesses, you know, are you allowed to four female witnesses maybe? Uh, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I really never came across a situation like mm -hmm. this, but we know for a fact that the other missing male could be replaced by two women for the same reason that you mentioned that they are deficient in their reasoning or their brain. So another reason, uh, another uh, you know, condition for marriage is that you have to have a guardian, and we'll talk about that uh, quickly. And then the condition about the groom, one of it is that the, uh, the groom has to be Muslim, of course. Uh, and then the condition about the bride. And here's what's so interesting. I want to talk at least about who can give you away in marriage according to the Shafi'i school of Sharia. Mm -hmm. Your father can give you to marriage. Your father's father, who is like your grandfather, basically. Uh, your brother can give you away in marriage. Your brother's son, your own nephew can do that. Your father's brother, your uncle, but his son, the son of your uncle, your cousin can also give you away in marriage. And then you have the religious magistrate, which you mentioned that basically. So I think people need to understand that where is the right for women here? If even my, my own nephew can give me away in marriage under Sharia, and he have that authority according to the Islamic authority, basically. So have you dealt with any of issues like this in your upbringing? Maybe uh, any uh, person that is close to you, some friends, some relatives, some family. Did you know any of these things? I know you said you grew up in at least more of an open-minded, uh, at least family. But in the culture itself, were you exposed to such things? <clears throat> Not me personally. I mean, the only time that I, I experienced this was when I actually wanted to get married to somebody. And my father explicitly was not happy with my choice um and i just thought well i can still marry off my own merit then i can go and i can just get married and it was only because obviously he was a lot more religious that he came back and he said to me well under sharia you are not allowed to marry without having a guardian and if your father is not going to give you away you need to go and find somebody else within your household who is willing to do that even if it's your younger brother you know my younger brother is he, he's younger than me you know a, a lot younger than me and I, I certainly wouldn't have been happy being given away, you know, by a, a 14 year old. You know, this is just something that I wasn't wasn't going to do. Um, and there was nobody in my family that would do that, which is then why we then took the next stage was was to approach somebody, a, 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 an Islamic cleric who I didn't even know at all. But yet, because he was a male, he had that superiority over me simply because he was a male. He wasn't related to me. He had no authority over me in any other way, but just the fact that he was male. And that goes to show how sub how women in, under Islam are real subordinates to men. No matter how much, you know, Muslim women want to do mental gymnasts and, gymnastics and say that we are emancipated, you know, we're free, we have equality and we have rights under Islam. Unfortunately, the truth is you don't because you can't even marry without having a male give you away you know in the in the in the english tradition you know a father walks his bride down down the aisle because it's it's a nice gesture it's something nice to do it's not incumbent on a father to walk his 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 daughter down the aisle but under islam it is incumbent it, it is a prerequisite for a woman to be married for for her guardian to actually give her away 
Um, and this is, a, again, going back to the fact that under Islam, marriage is a contract. It's not bound by, you know, by by love. You know, it's it, it simply a contract. Um, you know, it's not reciprocated by love and commitment. You know, it's not making a covenant before God, you know, to love one another, you know, in the way Christ tells husbands to love their wives, to love one another. I think it's in Ephesians, it talks about, you know, for husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. You know, he, gave, he gave his life up for her. Right. A husband is not told to do that. He's never told to love his wife like he loves the mosque or like he loves Allah. He's not told to do these things. Um, so, you know, and this this just goes to show the submission of the comparison of the submission. So under Islam, it's the wife is having to submit to her husband. Whereas in Christianity, Christ tells us to submit to one another for the reverence of him, for his glory. You know, for him to be part of that marriage. A marriage is a covenant between three people, a man, a woman and Christ. Amen. And you know, and it's and it's about, you know, glorifying Christ. Ultimately, that's what marriage is. You know, you get married to glorify Christ. There is no other reason for man and woman really to get married. It's to glorify Christ and to make his name go high. But under Islam, a man is to marry a woman and it's contractual. It's for his own needs and it's for him to be superior above her. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put a question for you right here. And, and again, I apologize if anyone is hearing some echo. Uh, periodically, I do hear that. Uh, here is a question, a, an excellent question. What happens if the woman says no? I mean, please feel free to elaborate on this, and I'll also elaborate on that. There is some, some cultural issue involved here as well. Yeah, I mean, this is where this is where there is a fine line between religion and culture. And if I bring the cultural aspect to it, and maybe, brother, you can explain the religious aspect to it. So if a woman says no, culturally, that is seen as being extremely disobedient, extremely disobedient, disobedient to one's father. It's considered shameful as well. When a woman under under the Islamic culture, if you like, gets married, a woman isn't just marrying a man. She is marrying into is one family marrying into another family. And I think you find historically as well, Muhammad did this as well because the, it was part of it, it was a way of him propagating his faith, I suppose, and, and making Islam spread. So for a woman to say no, it is considered to be extremely disobedient and it's not something that is is really um it's not something that is really done, to be honest with you. And also if a woman says no, there is I don't know if it exists over over in the US, but in the UK there is such a thing as honor killings, where if a woman is saying no because maybe she's got somebody of her own choice or you know somebody who her, who, her, who her family don't agree with, you know there is a high possibility that she could be killed. And honor killings are something that that in this country especially is rife, and I know it's rife in places in the Middle East and in Pakistan as well. So saying no, it, although you know most women will say, well I can say no if I want. The truth is. They, they don't, they're not allowed to say no. They're taken abroad. Um, they're, they're without recourse of, of any uh, finances. They, they have their passports taken off them. You know, they, they don't know how to come back home. Um, their whole family is against them. There usually is a huge conspiracy when a girl is married under duress. You know, the whole family are in on it. And unfortunately, she's taken and she's married and against her will. And then she's, she, she just, you know, she, she cowers to living this life. Because she, she feels as though there is no way out. Because anybody who she turns to will tell her that she needs to toe the line. And unfortunately, that is what I went through whilst I was married, when I felt that there was no way out. When I turned to my community, when I turned to um, my in-laws and uh, uh, even the imams, I was constantly told the same thing. I needed to go back to my husband. And I, if I was a disobedient wife, I would be going to hell. And when you're told that, you know, nobody wants to go to hell, especially a woman. You know, which woman wants to go to hell and drag her children with her? With her? It, it, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's something that doesn't, no one, one woman wants. So maybe you, brother, can bring the religious aspect of the teachings on that. Certainly, there, there isn't a specific thing, let's say, that uh, talks about that in the Quran, about if a woman said no, but ultimately, there isn't anything that also that prevents the wali, you know, the guardian in this case, to also listen to the opinion of woman. Obviously, uh, the fact that he is considered to be the guardian, that means he is the one who have the wisdom to decide what is better for that girl and that and they'll use usually a number of reasoning behind it and let's say you you went to a sharia law 
court and you told the judge that my parents wants me to marry somebody and I don't want to marry him, don't expect the judge to be on your side. I mean, they're not going to really even care for your opinion unless if you have really compelling evidence that this guy is a, is a nasty murderer, drug dealer, or whatever. That's assuming you can prove even any of these things. The judge is not going to take care of uh, that issue simply because they're going to look at the guardian as the wise person, especially if he happens to be the father. And the father will say, listen, you know, she's at a marriage age. I uh, want to care for my honor. I don't want her. We're living. Let, in, in fact, let's use England uh, as the case or, or, or Canada or the U.S. or Europe. You're going to say, listen, we're living in a different culture. And here dating is allowed and I want to protect my honor. And I don't want my daughter to be dragged into these kind of uh, cultural norms that are against my Islamic values. And that's why I have chosen a Muslim person for her, somebody that I trust. And of course, sometimes the parents will look at, oh, this guy comes from a wealthy family. I mean, uh, we want you to have this marriage because you're going to be set for life. I mean, all that kind of stuff that you Absolutely. hear. But, to, but the short answer of it, there isn't a, anything that prevents a guardian, Welly, to, uh, from making a decision on your behalf, even if you said no. Absolutely. And this brings it back to the whole contract thing again, because it goes to show that women do not, you don't necessarily have that choice because what happens if you say no, what are your choices? Your uncle's son or maybe your um, other uncle's son? You know, your, your, your choice is still going to be a very, very, um, it's not going to be a broad spectrum. Your choice is always going to be just a few and that's your choice. So if you have a choice between three, which is your uncle's son, your other uncle's son, or maybe your father's friend's son, who are all Muslims, who all, you know, uh, you, you're marrying them all for the same reasons, because they can set you up for life or they can give you financial stability. This goes back again to the contract of marriage. Marriage is not based on love. It's not showing. It's not based on having a companionship. It's based on a very factual process, which is can this person look after you financially? Can this person provide for you? Are you going to have a good home to live in? And these are the things that uh, a guardian will look at when he's making that decision on behalf of his um, uh, female daughter or you know niece or whoever it may be. Excellent. And uh, I want to thank everybody, of course, uh, who's with us here and specifically our moderators. They're doing a great job. And uh, thank you, of course, for uh, joining us on this a uh, special edition of Let Us Reason with us here, our dear sister, uh, our honor guest, uh, Sister Khadija, who had uh, been with us at least two weeks ago, shared her testimony. And I encourage you all to go to our uh, YouTube channels here international to watch her powerful testimony. And also, uh, I want to give a shout out to, uh, to all of you uh, subscribers. Uh, we have seen an increase in sub uh, our subscribership. I think it jumped up by at least uh, another three to 4,000 in the last two months. Uh, with that comes our appeal. Um, you know, I'm a, we're missionaries. We, we live by faith. Uh, so if the Lord puts you in your heart to become a Patreon patron, we encourage you to do so or give in a variety of ways. Believe it or not, we just got approved um, uh, to utilize also this feature called Super Chat. So thank you again for your dedication and your partnership with us. Uh, dear sister, um, what else would you like to uh, talk about in terms of the marriage contract itself while I also glance through and see if there are any specific questions for us? Okay, so one of the things that struck me was when, when I was getting married, um, it was actually done in, Eng in English, so I understood what was being said. So when... When I was being told what to recite, one of the things that I was being told to recite was to say, I have given myself in nikah to you, the husband, on the agreed mahar, which was a hundred pounds, let's say. That's what made me agree to my marriage. So I was saying that I'm giving myself in marriage to you on the agreed monetary amount. And then the husband ex either accepts the marriage contract or he rejects it. And in most cases, it's accepted because everything, everything is pre-agreed. So that, again, is proof that the, the that marriage under Islam is a contract, because even in the utterance of, of actually bringing that covenant, if you like, together, you're actually saying, you're actually saying two things. I'm giving myself in marriage, so this nikah, which is a contract, on the agreed monetary amount. So it doesn't mention any love, doesn't mention compassion, humility, care, mercy. It doesn't mention that you're going to stand by each other through the good, the bad and the ugly. 
It doesn't mention any of these things. Why? Because Islamic marriage is a, is simply as it is simply a contract. That's it. And it's so important for women to understand this fact. It's so important. So now let's say you have your contract. Okay. So I've actually got a copy of an of a Islamic contract here. This is it, guys. This is it. This is an Islamic. This is your marriage certificate. This A4 sheet of paper. This is it. Okay. So you've got your contract. Contracts usually have terms and conditions, don't they? So I know you're probably asking, well, what are the terms and conditions? There's no terms and conditions in here. It's a blank piece of paper on the other side. You'll find your terms and conditions in here, in the Quran and in the Hadith and in the book that Brother al Fadi that you have. That's where you will find your terms and conditions. OK, so let's go through some of those contractual terms then. OK, so number one. As a wife, you can only have one husband. No, that's the only thing. You can only have one husband. Your that's, husband that's, that's the woman. Husband. One husband, the not woman. the man, of course. The yes. Woman. The woman, the, the man, sorry, the husband. Your husband can have up to four wives. Exactly. You know that? As a wife, you can only have one husband. But your husband, he can have up to four wives. If you fear that you might not treat, and, and there's a Quran verse, actually, and it's Surah 4, 4 verse 3. It says, if you fear that you might not treat the orphans justly, then marry the women that seem good to you. Two, three, or four. If you fear... And, and by the way, dear sister, I want to comment on this. There are some people in the Muslim world that look at that as just an example, not as a condition. Meaning, you can marry twice, thrice, four times, and they can keep adding. And some in Africa use the marriage of Muhammad up to 13 wives, I think. Uh, they use sometimes, they, there is a debate whether 11, 13, or even if you have the concubine. So they use that. In other words, they can marry even beyond four. But I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. But these are, these are rights and these are things that are available for men only, not for women. As a woman, you can only have one husband and that is it. OK, your husband can also, by the way, have a temporary wife, which is known as, um, is it called, is it known as muta? Muta marriage, but that's usually Shia practice this yes, more common. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so you're right. So this is a practice for Shias where, where Muslim men are able to have like a temporary, a temporary marriage with a woman where he can go and have, have another wife just for a very, very short, short period of time. But this is something that's not available to women, even in the Shia faith, even in the, uh, uh, the Shia sect. This is not something that is av available to women. It's only there for men. So is this fair? Is this equality? I don't think so. I don't think this is equality. Now, another thing, number two, women, you are now like fertile fields for your husband, okay? You cannot deny him access to your body. Surah 220, Surah 2, 223 tells us this. So your wives are places of sowing your seeds. So come and play, come to your place of cultivation however you wish and put forth yourselves. Okay, you don't have a choice. When your husband needs to satisfy himself, he will come to you as and when he wishes. There is no such thing as rape under Islam. As a wife, you, it is your duty to be available for your husband at any time. This is your duty. However, it doesn't work the other way. It does not work the other way. And there is a hadith tradition that says that the angels will be cursing that wife if she did not satisfy her husband's desires or needs, sadly. I mean, think about this for a second, folks, that you are being threatened all the time, that you're not, uh, you know, that even the angels got nothing else to do other than to curse a woman for not meeting her husband. So, I mean, I don't know about the Muslim angels. Our angels are busy doing other things that are more beneficial for us, actually. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I mean, as a Muslim woman, as a wife, you cannot sexually deprive your husband of, 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 of his needs. But the other way around, it, you know, it, it can't happen. But you're absolutely right. If a, if a, if a woman deprives her husband I mean, I, I had this several times with, you know, in I heard it several times within my own marriage, you know, amongst the women when they were all had their heads together and they're all speaking and they were, you know, they were saying, oh, you know, you can't, you can't say no because the angels are going to curse you until the morning, you know, and, 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 and they really believed this and they actually went away believing this and goodness knows how many women are, are raped under 
under Islam within their marriage, but yet they don't see it as rape. I mean, it happened to me several times, several times, but you can't call it rape because under Islam, there is no such thing as, as ra raping your wife. It just doesn't exist. Right. And I want to just comment, uh, Alicia saying muta marriage is not a Shia practice. It was Muhammad's practice. I understand that, uh, Alicia. What I'm saying is you're going to go and talk to Sunni scholars now and they're going to deny it and they're going to say it's been abrogated. The only branch of Islam that I'm aware of that practices it openly are the yeah. Shia branch. So let's just be clear here. Now, um, uh, there, there was a question by Be Good uh, uh, for All, I believe, the name of the person. Uh, and the question is excellent. They asked me, but I think they, they intended to ask you, have you came across any woman where you at uh, and uh, who are Muslim women and they are sharing with you their concerns? They are willing to leave Islam over this mistreatment, mis uh, this unjust uh, basically treatment. I mean, you don't have to share details, of course, but uh, are you noticing any such, such thing, uh, uh, you know, whether in the past or now? Yes, they, I mean, there are women that are, that are seeing that that the treatment is wrong. I mean, whether whether they whether they believe that there's a way out or not, that's different. But you know, even when even when I was a Muslim woman and when I was telling sharing what I was going through, you know, women were saying to me, "Yeah, I, I know, I know, it's not fair, but you know, you have to be the patient one. You know, Allah Allah's testing you. You know, and unfortunately, you know this." This is a this is a clear sign of, of of abuse where Muslim where where women actually feel that the abuse that they are receiving is justified and unfortunately under Islam it is drilled into them so deeply that they will justify that misbehavior they will justify that abuse because ultimately they want to please their God they want to please Allah and if that means that they are being abused they're being hurt they're being raped within their marriage they're being negated of any rights within their marriage they will do that because they love allah more than they than than they than they hate the abuse that they are suffering and you know speaking about women generally i have spoken to women where they are seeing they are realizing that what they are going through is unfair and unjust but unfortunately many women do not feel that they have any recourse to a way out because a the community is silencing them whenever any abuse tends, takes place the community is immediately silencing them if they if they go beyond the community and they get in touch with sharia councils for example they will find that the sharia councils are male dominated um, and usually what will happen is the female is usually yeah. be usually be made to feel feel as though she's inferior she's uh, a bad woman and if she doesn't return to her abuser she's actually uh, going to go to hell. So Muslim women, unfortunately, are feeling very, very regressed and very and, and further abused by their own community. So this, they're being abused by their husband within their marriage. And when they're actually reaching out to their community, to their families, to their loved ones, um, they're actually being abused again because they're being told that you have no rights. You're a woman, you're a wife. You have to go and bear this. You know, this is Allah loves you. He's testing you. You know, if this is your husband, he he suffers impatience. You know, he's you know he's got an angry nature. You need to be patient. You need to show the sacrifice. And unfortunately, this is this is life within the community. Absolutely. Uh, I want to visit uh, uh, another comment by uh, uh, Alicia. Alicia is saying something. There is another temporary form of marriage, by the way, called misyar. Uh, but the only difference is that the misyar temporary marriage is not condoned by all Muslim scholars you know so that's the main distinguish uh, distinction between the muta marriage and the shia school of uh, basically uh, uh, sharia school of uh, of thought or jurisprudence if you wish versus the misyar only select scholars approve it and that's why i want to insist again the muta today is practiced almost unanimously under the Shari mm -hmm. uh, the shia school and it used to be of course something that muhammad instituted no doubt about that but it was supposedly abrogated Keep going, please. Okay. So another right Muslim women have under this contract of marriage is the fact that women, once you're married, you don't have to work. Yes, this is your right. You you earn it, you keep it. If you're working and you earn your money, you can keep it because it's now the obligation of your husband to provide for you, to clothe you, to feed you and to keep you sheltered. You know, I'm so glad that the Quran takes time to highlight this. I mean, if you look at any other religion, any other community in Western civilization, whether it's religious or secular, 
men have been natural breadwinners for generations for generations it's just it's just almost like a, a natural thing where men have always been the ones that have come home and, and provided uh, the, the the upkeep for the family home but the quran makes it clear that it's a husband's duty so we're glad that the quran does that i'm very glad that the quran does that but i can also tell you that unfortunately the quran what what muslim women forget is the Muslim husband, his own that obligation is only mandatory upon him if you are devoutly obedient, righteous, and if you keep yourself chaste. Now, if he fears, and this is the key thing, if he fears, doesn't need to have evidence, but if he fears that you are not obedient or righteously guarding in his absence, then he has no obligation to provide for you, none whatsoever. Right. You know, and this is something that Muslim women keep harping on about they keep saying well you know i'm emancipated i you know i don't need to work anymore my husband has to provide for me this has been stipulated in the quran this has come down from allah that my husband is 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 having to provide for me yes he does but what are your obligations to your husband you have to do certain things too and if he fears that you don't fulfill those obligations then he no longer has to provide for you now in 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 my experience my husband feared, this is very important, feared that I was a disobedient wife. He feared through his own insecurities and his own shortcomings that I wasn't doing the things that Allah had told, told me to do. And this led him to finding clear justification not to provide for me. Now, because I was working and I had my own successful business and you know I had my own recourse to money, of course, I was going to use my own money to support my home and my children, regardless of his fear. So when women are championing women's rights in marriage, you know, please stop. Be honest with the evidence before you in the Quran, you know, and really look, look at the evidence before you and don't just cherry pick the good bits. Look at it in its whole entirety and you will find that if you have a husband who for some reason is insecure or is in fe fearful that, you know, you may be, I don't know, looking at other men or inviting other men into your home or not being obedient or not, you know, not fulfilling your duties correctly, then he has every right to stop, uh, stop, stop his duty and, and provide for you. That's right. And again, thank you, of course, for uh, really making time uh, for us to share such an important topic. By the way, uh, I see the name Islam Critiqued. Is that the Islam Critique that I know? If uh, if that's the person, uh, welcome, my friend. I've been, believe it or not, trying to find a way to connect with you. If you are the one who makes these amazing videos, and you just did one recently uh, about uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the five basically points about uh, the marriage in Islam, uh, which it was hilarious, actually. I appreciate the type Excellent. of stuff you do. If that's you, please let me know how I can connect with you. I definitely would love to connect with you. In fact, I want to connect with you and bring you here as one of my uh, guests to talk about issues like this. I, I have to say I am not really that astute in terms of how I can find ways to connect with people on YouTube. But if you can kindly go to my website, which is sirainternational.com, you can email me through that, or let's find a way to try to communicate through Facebook, which is my page, alfadi.sira. Thank you again for joining us, by the way. Uh, there is there is a, a question here uh, related to, uh, or actually a comment maybe, related to polygamy that sometimes Muslim women would, would like to at least explain away the fact that when the Bible says that God created them male and female, in other words, God made them male and female, and then in Genesis 2.24, he says, for this reason, for this reason, the, uh, the man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave into his wife, and the two become what? One. 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 So One. it's not like two or three or four or whatever. Now, they try to explain away this embarrassing, of course, teaching. And they always use the Bible, by the way. Say, well, Abraham has more than one wife. And David has a... Well, I can tell you this much. Show me where did Allah tell Abraham, God, I should say, Yahweh. Where did he tell Abraham or David or Solomon in the Bible to go and have multiple marriages? If you can find it for me, show it to me. Now, the fact that God tolerated it doesn't mean he approved it. That's the, the culture of those days. And they paid a price for it, by the way. Nevertheless, they try, the Muslim men try to explain away and say, well, there is a lot of women population wise 
Have you ever heard of a, a, a you know explanation like this? Basically, all the time. I mean, uh, this is something that I hear all the time, and it makes me laugh really because, you know, <laughs> Muslim women are always the first to try and defend when a man wants to have more than one wife. Now, my ex-husband, his his uncle actually had more than one wife. He had two wives within the family. So it was something that was, you know, before my eyes on a daily basis. And the way that this was explained away was, well, Islam allows it, first of all. But what they say is, well, in the time of war, you know, there was a lot more women than there were men. Men were going out to war. They were being killed. There was a surplus of women. These poor women, they had nobody to look after them. So these men were doing, it was almost like they were doing um, a community service, really. <laughs> they were doing a service to their community by marrying more than one woman. Now, let's look at the emotional implications that it would have on a woman if she was to be a second or a third wife. Now, I was never a second wife. I was I was one wife. OK, I was never a second wife, but I knew women who were second wives. And let me assure you of the emotional turmoil that these women were going through. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Now, they, they hid this from their husbands. But these women, these two women who I knew, they had to live the husband provided everything equally just as it says in the quran you have to provide equal they wore they actually wore the same clothes they looked like twins when they went out it was hilarious you know they, they dressed the same they had they were given the same gifts they he even spent the same amount of time with them in the bedroom they had set days in the bedroom however that husband still had his his favorite he still had a preference of one over the other there is no way in a marriage a man can can treat both women equally emotionally physically financially it cannot happen financially he can do it that's fine he can do that it's it's easy to sort that out but how can he do that emotionally how can he do that physically it's impossible it's absolutely impossible. So when Allah is giving this commandment that, you know, you men, you can marry more than once as long as you treat them with, with I don't know what the verse is. I think it's where he says, as long as you treat them with kindness and fairness and equality, then you can do this. And if you feel that you're able to do this, then go ahead and get married. This is all, almost like an impossible task. It's an impossible task. But yet men are marrying more than one woman. And it's not it's not just happening in Pakistan. It's happening here in the Western world as well, because what they are doing is they're using the nikah contract to get married to more than one wife, because if they are to marry more than one woman under English law, they would be seen as bigamists. And that is obviously illegal. So they're not doing that. What they are doing is they are just using the Sharia law, the marriage contract of nikah to marry more than one woman. Now, the emotional implications that these women are facing, it's something that cannot be fixed. There is no way it can be fixed. When when this auntie, there were two aunties, when when one of those aunties was being treated with more time and more affection and more love by her husband, how did that make her feel? Let me tell you how it made her feel. It made her feel unloved, unappreciated. It made her feel less than. It made her feel inferior to even to even another woman. Surely. A loving God would not want that for women. I know Christ doesn't want that for me. I know Christ wants me to enter into a marriage where I'm going to be loved by him and by my by my husband. But Allah, on the other hand, he clearly shows that women are, are a commodity for the use of their husbands. And this clearly is something that is man-made. It's not from God. It's man-made. That's right. And uh, I have a couple of uh, Muslims here. Um, one is asking a sincere question, and uh, I'll respond to Wahid Rahman. I'll respond to it right now. Uh, the other one, his name is Ultimate Truth, who is actually, I think he meant to say the ultimate liar, but he just forgot to type it that way. So Ultimate Liar is saying that in Deuteronomy 22, if a man rapes a woman, a girl, right? And you read about that in Deuteronomy 22, 28, that you marry her. And he's saying that means you can really end up marrying more than one wife. Well, only if you're a sick man and you end up raping a lot of women, guess what? There is a limit basically to how far you can go because after a while, I think everybody gets it that you need to be dealt with differently, right? Now, in there, God is not giving commands for people to do this. God is dealing with situations, real life situations. And actually, I would argue, 
ultimate liar, that God in the Bible is honoring the woman and her honor and the honor of her family. OK, nowhere that it's forcing her to marry this wicked man. OK, that's number one. Number two, he's using the same example and saying, look at the wisdom of Allah. In the Quran, chapter four, verse three, he's allowing you to marry two and three up to four only. Wow, what a wise God, actually. After four, supposedly you cannot marry anymore. Guess what? You think men, by the way, don't know how to get around this? You can release one that you don't like anymore and marry another one. Yeah. I've known people who married up to 13. You know what? Yeah. But they keep divorcing one and marry another one. Divorcing them. In fact, your own uh, fabulous prophet, uh, he himself was going to give away, I mean, a divorce soda uh, because yeah. she was old and she was fat and he didn't like her. But she finally negotiated a deal with him. She knew he's all about, you know, sleeping with women. So she told him, hey, guess what? I'll give you my night and you can spend two nights with Aisha, the one who was nine when he consummated his marriage and he was 54 years of age. So that's the kind of stuff we deal with. By the way, do you, did you know, Sister Khadir, that the Quran actually allows men who capture married women to sleep with them, even if their husbands were still with them. And some of the Sharia law schools will say the fact that they're captured and they became slaves, their marriage has been negated. Absolutely. And this, this in itself is proof that the whole religion of Islam is male orientated and it's all about the sexualization of women and the sexual appeasement of men. And unfortunately, Muslim women need to wake up to this reality and they need to admit the truth of this reality as well. Instead of tiptoeing around the issues, tiptoeing around not only not only the uh, the, the the textual um, um, uh, problems in the Quran, but in their real lives that are taking place, the actual practicalities of this as well. They need to start telling the truth about this, even if they don't tell it, even if they don't say it outwardly, admit it to yourselves. This is the first step to finding the truth. You're going to be stuck in that bondage until you come to a place where you can actually say to yourself, what I am going through is abuse. It cannot be from an all loving God. This has to be a man made religion. And there's your starting point, sister. That is your starting point for your journey to find the truth. And the truth is, is Christ. He will reveal to you through the Holy Spirit that Allah is not the truth. Muhammad was not a prophet nor a messenger of God, but the truth will be revealed to you because it's only when I mean, I for me, I had to go through my marriage, my Islamic marriage for me to come to a rock bottom place for me to find the real truth, because it was when I came to that rock bottom place, I thought morally, you know, morally, this is wrong. How can any human treat another human like this? And then when I turned to the Quran. And I found everything that I was, all the treatment that I was going through was coming from this book. Then I was on the road to recovery. That's when I was cited that my road to recovery. And Muslim women, you really have to stop believing that we are bashing Islam, that we are bashing your rights as Muslim women. We're not doing that. We're trying to now highlight some facts to you. As a Muslim, as an ex-Muslim woman who was married, who was once a Muslim, who's gone through all of this, I'm imploring to you, I am, you know, if I could reach out to you and hold your hand and say to you, please, you really need to wake up. You really need to wake up. The clock is ticking. You being a Muslim woman, being stuck in this marriage is giving you n nothing but darkness, depression. I mean, I've got doctor, I've got friends who are doctors. And when I lived in the Muslim community, most of the women um, that were part that that went to see my 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 doc, my friend doctors. Most of the Muslim women, unfortunately, they were suffering from depression, and it was all due to marital discourse. Even some of the women that I was speaking to, a lot of them, you know, they were putting up with it, but they was they were clinically depressed, and it was because of their marital problems that they were they were having. And where did these marital problems come from? It came from their religion. It came from the Quran. It came from the Sunnah. It came from the Prophet Muhammad. The only way, the best medicine, the best antidote isn't for you to go have Prozac. It's for you to get out of that darkness. It's for you to admit what the Quran is telling your husbands to do. It's a treatment. I mean, look, 
you know, we everyone seems to fall back on that verse where a husband can beat his wife. Let's go and let's look at that verse. Okay. So as a Muslim woman, you have to you you have to toe the line. Okay. You have to be an obedient wife. Okay. You have to toe the line. If your husband fears that you are not an obedient wife, then he's allowed to he's he's allowed to beat you. I mean that that verse is it for Surah 434. Is it is that the verse through four thirty four? It is, it is uh, four thirty four, and now I'm I'm pretty sure next time we meet, we need to address that as part of yeah. some of the rights of women who are married. But you're absolutely correct. If you fear, it didn't say yeah. if they do anything. If you fear uh, uh, disloyalty or you fear something, then you have the right to beat them. And of course, some translators are struggling with this. To, so, like uh, for instance, uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali will say, "Beat them lightly." He will add that phrase, which is not even in the original Arabic anyway. Why? Out of embarrassment. I don't blame him because he is definitely embarrassed to try to explain away something in English to European and Western culture that value the rights of women. Now, uh, I want to uh, address uh, the question by uh, Wahid rahman Wahid rahman was saying, show me one verse in the Bible that says you cannot marry more than one wife. Well, you know, I don't know if you've been wa uh, listening to what I said or not. In Genesis chapter Chapter 2, verse 24, I'm going to read it again for you, and I'm going to comment on it. Here's what it says. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave into his wife, and the two shall become one. Guess what, Wahid rahman the word one is? Ahad. Don't you go around all the time telling us that the word ahad basically means one? Sadly for you, that's not what it means. But anyway, I'm using your word now, and that's the word in there. If you go to the New Testament, the conditions for elders, they have to be a husband of one wife right there. Beside, the absent of a command doesn't mean that it is allowed. Show me where did God ever approved of these multiple marriages. If you can show me his approval and blessing of it, I'll go ahead and grant you that. Dear sister, Absolutely. you have uh, actually there is an excellent question by Melly. I'm going to put the question right here. It's an excellent question we deal with all the time. What would you like to say to those non-Muslim women who are dating a Muslim man? You know, I would like to comment on it myself after I hear from you. Okay, so what happens to non-Muslim? Can you put the question up again? Sorry? Sure, sure. It's uh, it's basically if you have a non-Muslim woman who are dating a Muslim man, what advice would you like to give to them? Get out. Don't and Me why escape because you are just inviting yourself into a whole load of trouble and heartache if you want to have bliss if you want to have a a, a life which is full of love and joy get out don't even go there because i'll tell you something if you're going into that relationship with the expectation that you are going to change him it's not going to happen islam has a superiority it has a natural superiority. You cannot go into that re into that relationship with the belief that you are going to convert him to your way of thinking, whether you're a Christian or a Hindu or whatever you may be. It's never going to happen. And he's going to make you convert to his religion. And that means under Islam, what are your rights as a woman? As a woman? Well, we've been talking about them. You don't have any rights. So my advice to you is leave. Honestly, right. leave. Go find yourself. Go find yourself a good Christian man. And become a Christian yourself, sister. Go into the That's light. Nice. And, and I want to warn any any non-Muslim woman who is dating a Muslim man. And I'm not saying Muslim men are not wonderful men. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, whatever reason you have, I'm going to have to tell you the following. And you have to hear me out completely, especially if you are claiming to be a Christian. First, the Bible is against unequally yoked. I mean, you yes. are discouraged Correct. from having that. Number two, you have to understand that Islam is always superior to any other faith regardless. Number three, even if this man is the most wonderful Muslim man you'll ever meet, sometimes his culture, his family, his friends will impose ideas on him and it's not up to him. And if he becomes religious and goes basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, religious on you, Best of luck with that. He's gonna. It's really gonna have. He's gonna have to question himself now. Why did he marry someone that is not a Muslim? Uh, so your choices are very limited. Accept Islam, or sadly, things may not end well for you. If you have children, he may take the children away from you at some point. Or the least he can do is to go and marry another person. How would you like that to happen in your life? So don't tell me that he's a wonderful person today. Well, yeah, marriage requires a lot of work. 
How would you work it out if he believes in Allah and you believe in Yahweh? Uh, two different gods, basically. And I don't think it's going to work that way as well. Absolutely. And, and and just to further further on to that as well, one of the things as Christians that we have within marriage is we have Christ within our marriage. Okay, so a marriage is between a man, a woman and Christ. Marriage is a hard, it's a very difficult road, you know, it's full of ups and downs. There's no such thing, you know, as a perfect marriage. Um, but as Christians, when your marriage begins to see those hard times, you have a you have Christ who you turn to. And be rest assured, Christ will always give you the best outcome. He will always give you the best advice and he will make it so he's in the center and he will witness to both of you. And the Holy Spirit is there and he's with you and he will guide you to, to come into a peace of tranquility and to a peace where uh, a place where you can both find uh, um, uh, compromise. Under Islam, unfortunately, what you will find is the compromise will always come on this part of the woman, always. Even if you have a husband who is naturally a nice, loving husband, he will be he will befall to family pressures, to cultural pressures, to pressures within the community. So even though he he you know he may love you and he you know he he may want to do what's right by you, unfortunately, his his religion is going to take precedence over his feelings, and that's always going to win. And, you know, if the community, let's just say if you are a Christian, for example, you're not going to really be able to practice your faith openly. And if you have children, your children are going to have to take the faith of your husband. And if you're not happy with that, there's nothing you can do. And your husband can marry again if he, if, if he feels that you're not going to bring his children up correctly and take your children from you. So before you enter into this whole heartache, just do yourself a favor. Just leave. You know, it's, and it's sad, but you know that that is my sincere advice. It yes, really and I want to, I want to, I don't want to add to this. You know, um, uh, suppose, suppose uh, you, as a Christian, married a Muslim man, and you couldn't give him children. Do you know that that's one of the conditions under Sharia for him to go and marry a second wife on you? How would you like it? Not only you're feeling miserable already, sadly, and you're feeling inferior now, and you're feeling like you cannot give something that you desire to have in your life. Now you're being felt marginalized as well on account of something that is out of your control. So you have to be careful because only if you are truly a Christian, marrying a Christian man, that he will understand the role of the Lord in your lives Versus yeah. someone who, by the way, like I said, his parents could influence him and say, what are you doing? You know, I know some men, Muslim men, that their parents even won't even uh, even talk to them for daring to marry a somebody who is not a Muslim. The condition either, either she converts or we don't know you at all. So he's going to risk losing his family. And guess what? Do you think you want to lose his family on account of you? Maybe he's lusting right now. Maybe he is excited about the marriage right now. But in a few months or a few years, you, you'll be just, just another person in his life. And when we talk next time about the rights and including divorce, you'll see how simple and easy it is for him to bail out of this commitment, which is nothing whatsoever. Yeah. Final words, just, dear sister. And just, just quickly going back to the fact that you know your, your husband can, can throw you out of your bed. He can beat you, you know, if you're disobedient. A Muslim woman can't. You can't do that as a wife. You can't do that. I mean, even Aisha said that she never had. She had never seen as much suffering as a believing women, women, women. And her assessment was based on the amount of Muslim women who were being abused through the explicit permission of Muhammad and the Quran. You know, so it's for me, it's 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 a no go. You know, don't don't even don't even go there. So what else? What else are your rights then under Islam as a as a married woman? You're not allowed to leave the home without a chaperone or without the permission of your husband. OK, you can't do that. You need to have permission from your husband when you leave the home. You need to have a chaperone. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. So you're not an equal. Your husband can leave the house whenever he wants. He doesn't need permission. He can leave um, within your marriage. You're of, de you're of deficient mind. Therefore, you are inferior to your husband. Whether you like to admit it or not, this is what the Quran tells, tells us. This is what Muhammad says. Women are of deficient mind, so how can you be equal to your husband within your marriage? You know, he is superior to you. You know, so you know, women have to be very, very careful, I think, when they are engaging, when they're coming to a point where, you know, they are thinking about marriage, especially when they are not Muslim women and they are looking to marry into the Muslim faith. Be very, very careful. Absolutely. And uh, Zemzem, uh, I haven't forgotten about your question, but uh, next time we are going to talk about divorce 
uh, whether next uh, time we, we do this or maybe along the series that we're doing, we're gonna talk about divorce. And along the line, her question was about the children. What would happen if somebody wanna leave a marriage because of an abusive husband and things like that? And I think I wanna keep this until next time because it's a very yeah. important question. Yeah, and we I can think- discuss that. Yeah, we can discuss that next time because I can actually bring my, um, my actual exactly. experience into that. Exactly. So that's a big topic we can discuss next time absolutely thank you so much dear sister and i hope everybody's excited about the fact that we will be doing this jointly for a while talking about women rights under islam talking about we talked today we talked about marriage we're going to talk next time about some of the rights during the marriage we may even talk about divorce whether next time or the time after so we are going to really critique this uh, uh you know slowly and gradually step by step uh, and again i want to really reach out to our Muslim people who are watching this. Nowhere that we are picking on you. We're actually sharing about this because we love you and we care for you. We are discussing what Islam teaches. That's something you have no control over. You know, you can disagree with us right now. You can get mad at us if you want. That's entirely up to you. But you have no control over the fact that this is what Islam teaches. This is what the Quran teaches. This is what the Prophet of Islam teaches. This is what the Sharia law teaches on account of what these sources are doing. So you have no control over it. Uh, you know, you can you can tell me that's not what happened in my culture. Good for you. You are unique. You are the exception, not the rule. The rule goes basically out of the Quran, out of the teaching of Muhammad, and that's what the majority of the Muslim community will abide by and they will go by. Uh, you know, dear sister here came from an open-minded family, but she, when she met real Islam, she was shocked, technically speaking, and hopefully she will share about that one more time. You can listen to our testimony. So thank okay. you again, dear sister, for coming with us. We're excited about thank this. You. We're looking forward for next time. Thank you for all of those who uh, use the Super Chat. We appreciate you. We appreciate your support. Thank you for those of you who joined us today and took time out of your busy schedule uh, to be with us. I know there is a lot of wonderful live streams out there. So hopefully this was worth your time. And of course, we want to thank our moderator for a hard work. And uh, I am so blessed to have all of you. Final words, dear sister, if you have any. So just to reiterate what you said, actually. So we're not here to to bash Islam or to, you know, to, to to talk negatively. We're here to show the truth. I wish that I had recourse to something like this before I got married to my Muslim husband. I really do, because I didn't know about my rights as a Muslim woman under Islam, what they were as a, as a wife. I didn't know what they were. I had the assumption that I was going to be treated with love, humility, respect, equality. That was my assumption. Had I had had I have had recourse to this kind of resource, maybe I would not have married the same way that I did then. Maybe I would not have suffered the abuse that I suffered. Maybe I wouldn't have had to have go would have go through the Sharia courts to try and get my marriage annulled. Maybe just maybe my children, my eldest son especially, wouldn't wouldn't have been taken off me. So these these live these live streams that we're doing. They're not here to bash people. They really are here to try and engage people, to encourage people and to educate people to the truth. And ultimately, the glory has to go to Christ. We are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to be witnesses for Christ, to give, to, to share the truth of the gospel, to share the love of Christ, the great grace of Christ. And Christ is waiting for you all. You know, Muslim women, especially you are the first you are the first victims of Islam. You really are. And if we can reach just one of you, if we can enlighten just one of you, then, you know, we've, do, we've, done, a, we've done a good job. You know, and ultimately, that's what our prayers are. Our prayers are that you seek, you seek the truth and ultimately that you come to Christ for the truth because Jesus loves all of you and he's waiting. He's waiting for each and every one of you. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, wise words. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the people who will be watching uh, after this show is uh, on our uh, channel uh, will benefit from all of this. Thank you again. And God bless you. Take care, everyone.